Without further ado, welcome to Healthy Habits from uh, the OCES Parent University. Um, I'm really, really excited about this one. I know our presenters have put a lot of time and effort into putting this presentation together, and I am super excited to see what they have together for us. Um, so real quick, we're going to do an introduction of the presenters. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Family Engagement Center, um, talk a little bit about Parent University, and then we'll do an overview of today's presentation. Um, so we've got Carrie Halleck, who is uh, one of the PE teachers here at Coney County Elementary. We've got Danielle Hayes, our school nutrition manager, and Miss Lori Lewis, who is our fabulous school nurse. Um, so we're kind of hitting like a three-pronged approach to what we call healthy habits, you know, diet, exercise, taking care of yourself, you know, with medication and sleep and a little bit of, um, I think we'll talk about um, mental health too as well. So a lot of stuff wrapped up in this presentation. Um, so what is the Family Engagement Center? It's an inviting space for parents and volunteers, kind of a one-stop shop for different resources and manipulatives and books and kind of learning aids to help you and your student at home with anything they might be um, struggling with at school or maybe any gaps that need to be filled in. And one of the ways we do that for the students and the parents is parent university sessions, like what we're doing right here. Um, I think this is the fifth parent university session we've had, and they, they the range of topics is pretty broad, right? So this one's on healthy habits. We've had one on reading and math, and um, I think Title I funding, just kind of explaining what all that is and all the resources that are in there. Um, but all those are available on, a, um, on an archive on the Family Engagement website. Um, but also the parent university is something that OCES does for our parents and families. So if you have any input on this or future events, I want you to go to this parent university survey. It's going to be linked um, to the video and to the slideshow. Um, and just kind of give us some information on what you want to see out of these presentations because like they're for you, they're for you and your student. And uh, we want to make sure that um, we are, you know, addressing all the needs that our families and parents and students have. Um, so, the overview of today's presentation, um, Carrie, I believe, is going to go first. She's going to talk about PE, physical education, and how important it is. I mean, obviously, it's important to stay physically active, but she's going to try to give you some ways that you can make that even easier at home, um, kind of making sure that it's a, it's a whole family affair instead of um, just kind of giving you a, a workout plan or something like that. Um, after that, uh, if, I mean, if you want to give us a workout plan, I'm not going to stop. There we go. <laughs> Uh, after that, we're going to talk a little bit about um, food and diet with uh, Danielle Hayes, um, all the different uh, healthy eating habits, importance of breakfast, um, talking about the healthy lunch plate, you know, that fun infographic where the plate's all divided up into different food groups. Um, so some really good stuff on that. And then we're going to wrap up with um, Lori Lewis on, I believe, sleep, self-care, um, sharing your knowledge with your student, and different ways to stay informed. So after those three presenters wrap up, I've just got a couple of resource slides, um, some really good websites for you to check out with lots and lots and lots of information that is um, applicable um, to a lot of different scenarios. So tons of stuff in here. I know that feels like a lot, but we're going to go through it. And again, if you have any questions, definitely jot those down and we'll make sure and get them at the end of the presentation. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Carrie Halleck to talk about physical activity. Thank you. So thanks so much. I first want to apologize. I'm in the gym, but I'm in my office. So you may hear background noise because we do have a class going on right mm -hmm. now. So they're having so much fun in there. So you may hear a lot of yelling and screaming because they're playing a very intense game of swamp ball. So it's a very exciting time over here in the gym. Um, I did want to start with the benefits of physical activity. And then I'm going to go into screen time because that's a really big deal. I was a classroom teacher as well for a number of years and then PE. I'll give you a little background on myself. My master's is in public health um, with my emphasis on nutrition and as well as exercise. And then you can back that up. And then my undergrad was in elementary education. So I, I kind of have a broad spectrum of where children, um, children should be academically, but also physically and health wise and how that can benefit your family and, and how we can kind of get your whole family involved, especially going into the summer, it's a big deal. Um, the first thing I wanna talk about is the benefits of physical activity. Um, and if the next slide here, you'll see the brain benefits of exercise. And I, this isn't even the physical exercise, the physical um, benefits, but the, 
the brain benefits of exercise, I mean, you can find all of this on the internet, but increasing production of the chemicals that pro promote brain cell repair, improving memory, lengthening intention spans, boosting decision-making skills, which is so important for our kids as they're in the classroom, um, prompting growth of new nerve cells and blood vessels, and being able to multitask um, planning. And that doesn't even include um, you know, a lot of our students who struggle with attention deficit disorder, my own son is um, a student who has that. And um, being able to be physically ac active has definitely helped him in the classroom and being able to increase his um, ability to work in the classroom setting. And so there's so many, so many important um, physical aspects of that as well. When you go into just as your students are developing, I mean, they're at such a great age at eight, nine and 10 here in the elementary school where they're growing into themselves and their muscles are growing, their bones are growing. And so we want to make sure that we are doing a good job here of of helping them grow into who they can be the best version of themselves physically. But at home too, what does that look like? And if you go into the next slide, there's this really great video, well, it's two slides over, but what physical literacy is. And I'm not gonna go over the video that's in the next slide. I feel like that's something you can probably do at home. And sometimes over Google Meet, it gets a little, um, the timing of it gets a little off, but please, please watch the next video that's on here. Um, when we talk about physical literacy, I always start my year with that because I want the kids to have an understanding of what is it to be physically literate? I mean, we talk about what is academic literacy in the classroom, but how does that transfer into the gym? And if you can kind of see this diagram that I have here, it talks about being competent to move, motivated to move, and competent to move. Um, the biggest one that we start with is competency because we want our students to learn skills. They're at a great age um, where your child is learning how to throw, how to catch, um, how to kick a soccer ball. Um, when they, they have all of the rec sports going on, I know a lot of them are involved in that too, and they're learning a lot of those skills. And so that is the very first part of physical literacy. They need to have an understanding of how their muscles work together um, to be able to throw and to do those things. Um, once we get a good understanding of how our body works, we move to the motivated. Like how, how can we move our body in a way and apply what we learned um, mentally apply that into like how our body works and then having the confidence to do that as well um, and being able to do it the right way. And we work on skills over and over again so that they can learn the right way to throw, the right way to kick um, and the right way to move their bodies. And so it's a very important skill, um, just like when you talk about reading, right? We start with learning your ABCs and learning your blends and those types of things. We are taking the academic side of PE and taking it back a notch to like what are the basics and building off of those. And so the primary school does that and then we blend it into the elementary school up here. Um, in the next video, you'll see it's a great video and I really hope that um, you guys take a moment to watch it at home. Watch it together. Your kids have already watched it here with me, but it just does a really good job of explaining how all of those things work together and why we want them to be the best they can be. Um, the next skill is the next thing I want to talk about real quick is screen time. I know um, that's a big discussion in my house. We have ages four all the way up to 16 in my house. And screen time is a really, really big issue. And it's something that my family has spent a lot of time addressing because it's really easy to hand an iPad to a little kid or for a kid, my kids to grab their phones or their iPads and kind of be lost in their apps and um, take away from being able to move their bodies outside. And I know even as an adult, that's something that we've had to put boundaries on at home for us. And I linked down here a screen time plan for you to do with your family. Um, you can break it down to every member of your family from your littlest kid up to an adult. And you make a plan together. You can put it, you can print it, put it on your fridge. It's in English and in Spanish, which is great, a great option for our families. Um, and it comes from the American um, Academy of Pediatrics. So it's a very, very reliable source there. But I just want you to look at this for a second, the new time recommendations, because before they said no screen time before two, that rules kind of out because we just live in a world where we are with screens everywhere you go. But they say 18 months or younger, try not to have screen times. And then as you kind of grow, don't allow those to be solo, which is giving a kid an iPad and giving them time to just sit on the floor or watch, like do it with them, do an educational program together. And then two to five years old, limit screen time to an hour a day and six um, and up at eight, 
that's like limiting it to a time where your family can work on the best plan for yourself. There's this really, um, it's insane, this, this new study, well, not new, but a few years ago, a study came out by the Common Sense Media, and teens have, they on average spend nine hours, and that doesn't even include like academic, nine hours of screen time. Um, and if you back it up to the ages that we have here for an eight to 12 year old, they're averaging six hours of screen time a day, which is a lot. I mean, that is a lot. That doesn't account any academic time. That is purely TVs, movies, video games, um, anything on the iPads, things like that. So it's really important um, with our family, we have screen time plans. The biggest thing is we don't let our kids have their plugs in their rooms, take the plugs out of their rooms, have a common place for your kids to have plugs, um, to be able to put those things away at night, um, an hour before they go to bed, as long as their homework's done, try to like put the dimmers down on your iPads, try to put them away. Um, just make some smart plans for your family and, and really think through that. I think a lot in, you know, at least in my age growing up, that wasn't really an issue. We didn't have that. Um, we only had two TVs in my house and my parents were in control of those at all times. But I, I, that's not the case for my kids now. It's not the case for a lot of our kids at home. So really just having conversations about screen time, the safety of screen time. I know um, Deborah Newman and the library has done a really, really good job of talking about that and putting recommendations out for parents. If you need something, she has plenty of resources, but that's a really, really big deal. But check out that screen time plan that's linked here. And hopefully that will give your family some ideas that you can do together, um, because I think that's really important. And then moving on from screen time, there's actually, I put a summer screen time. You can Google any of these. Um, Google, and there's so many you can print for free if that's not, you don't want to do the other option. But for summer screen time, this is one that's very familiar that we do in my house, um, especially for my younger kids. Um, and this has been a great opportunity for them. They don't get any of their Xboxes or anything like that until they have done all of the things on their list in the summer. So I put that up there for you as just an option. But again, take that home, look it, look it up. There are so many to choose from online for screen time use. Um, the next thing I want to talk about, which is the biggest one, especially going into summer, is making it a family affair, is get moving as a family. So uh, my family, we sit down going into the summer, actually every season, but right now we're going into the summer, and we have a chalkboard, and we do uh, where we come up together as a family, all the activities we want to do together. So we've added, I'll give you some examples, we've added running every morning together, or going on a walk in the mornings together. Um, we live in a great part of Watkinsville where we can walk a lot and that's been super helpful. Um, going camping is a great way for your family. My kids love making up games. And so we make a day where it's each kid has the ability to have their own day and make up the activities that we do together. When we talk about um, family fitness and moving, we're not, you don't have to have like, oh, we're working out at the gym for 30 minutes and then we're gonna lift weights for 20 minutes. We're talking about just moving as a family this summer. Play games, go to the park, um, find some adventures, even local adventures that would be fun to get your family going together. Um, it's just really, really important that your kids see that you're wanting to be involved with them and then that makes them excited to move as well. Um, if you go to the next screen, there's a family fitness um, plan. You can come up with one of these. Set a good example is the biggest one. So if you're going on a walk in the morning and you put that on your list, say, okay, guys, let's go for a walk or a run or a bike ride every day. Enjoy it together, play games, um, praise effort, not results. That's a big deal for me. Um, and I hope that is for your family too. If you're out playing a game, we really want you to praise the effort that they're putting into it, not the fact that maybe they didn't hit the home run, but the fact that they actually got out there and tried and they gave it 100%. Um, offer positive reinforcements for a lot of our kids um, who, who maybe don't feel um, successful in exercising or working out, they need positive re reinforcement to continue doing things. Or if it's a new a new skill that they they really need a lot of positive reinforcements in that. And then have your child teach you. That's one of my favorite ones, and I brushed on that earlier. But um, we play a lot of games in here and do a lot of activities that maybe you're not familiar with. But that's a great one. You can say like, "What's a game that you played in PE today? How can we modify that and play it at home? Or what's a game that you want to play at home? How do you play dodgeball? I've not played dodgeball before, or kickball, or or soccer, or one of those skills. But have them teach you something. It makes them feel proud of themselves. It makes them excited, and it makes them want to do it again. And the last one is be creative, but to me, the most important is set dates and times. If you can set times to work together as a family or play together as a family, set dates on the calendar, especially with the summer coming up, that you can go and do things. We live in one of the best places in the country, and we are so close to 
um, all things in North Georgia, not too far from the beach. Um, I mean, not as close as where I grew up, but it's still four hours away. We can make it. So set some dates on your calendars for some activities where you guys can get out and do things together. Um, that is probably the most important thing is you have a plan and set a plan for screen time, set a plan for your family fitness and just have fun together. So that's what I have. I was trying to go through it fast so we could get through everybody today. And I really appreciate you guys listening. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, next up is uh, Danielle Hayes with Diet. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Danielle Hayes, the School Nutrition Manager at Oconee County Elementary School. Thank you all for joining in. Um, I will be discussing a healthy diet um, or the eating habits of your child. The three topics that I will be reviewing are the importance of breakfast, the healthy lunch plate, and healthy snacking. And Danielle, real quick, your camera is not on. I don't know if you want to put it on or not. Up to you. Losing a connection. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I'm sorry. There is a really bad connection in here. I have um, brick walls. Mm. Okay. You know, so I, can, I can hear I you. I apologize if there's an interruption. Okay. Mm. All right. So the next slide um, is the about the importance of breakfast. Mm. This, I can't stress it enough. Um, think, think about it. Your child wakes up. They get ready for school. Uh, they're taken to school by the bus or car, and then they So I would just like to go over some breakfast ideas uh, that um, we've come up with in the school nutrition department. Um, as far as, and, and it actually is a plate. Um, so if you go to the next slide, under breakfast ideas, it must consume um, a fruit and or a vegetable, a, a protein, a grain, and then a milk um, of some sort. So there has to be for it to be a considered a reimbursable meal through the school nutrition program. An example would be for breakfast would be like a chicken biscuit. It has uh, you know, your protein and they have to take a fruit at that point. Um, obviously, we wouldn't offer a vegetable unless it was in some sort of egg or, or you know, um, uh, substance. So if they would take like a half a cup of juice or an apple or banana to um, complete that three components um, breakfast. <clears throat> then um, the breakfast is also often called the most important meal. Of the day, it jumpstarts your student or your child with essential nutrition and good health. just goes into the breakfast, like I said, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Um, why is it the most important meal of the day? Well, it encourages healthy eating habits, eating breakfast, lunch, maybe a healthy snack, and then obviously dinner um, in, in the evening. It balances your blood sugar levels, uh, he healthy sugar levels, because we all do need some sort of sugar in our diet. Um, it kickstarts our metabolism throughout the day. Uh, it boosts our energy levels so we're not so sleepy or drowsy during the day. It promotes a healthy start, heart, I'm sorry. Um, and then it also, it stimulates the brain. This is the most important fact, factor. It, it, it's fuel or food needed to get through, get you through that day. Uh, it, it's just, I tell the kids that every morning when they come in and they look tired, I'm like, oh, we got to have breakfast, guys. 
we got, we got to feed that brain and it helps them think. Is anybody else able to hear? Uh, has this, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Can you see me? You yeah, <laughs> no, you, you dropped out for a second. I, yeah. Are you on healthy lunch plate? So, so I apologize for that. So the healthy plate, it consists of fruit, vegetables, grains, proteins, and dairy. Um, The next, I mean, if you go to the next slide, it gets a little bit more into, into depth about it. The components of the healthy plate. Proteins. Meats or meat, dark green, red, orange beans, and starches. The proteins, obviously, are your, like your chicken, beef, fish, um, Uh, eggs, nuts, seeds, chickpeas are a good source of uh, protein without um, meat or tofu. Uh, let's see. Then we got the grains. We try and stick with whole grains. Uh, it, it's just better for you. So, And then the milk, we offer 1% white milk and then a skim milk and a skim chocolate milk <clears throat> everything has to be low fat or no fat that's offered here um try and stay away vegetables uh dark are essentially the more vegetables being in the process in the in the week um so like we will have dark vegetables on one day and then we'll have like uh, uh, peppers like an orange pepper or something on i mean we have to rotate them we have to meet certain components of the um, diet. So with that, if you look at the next slide, it's just a little bit more um, fun to look at. It just tells you a little bit more about the plate. You have to have, just like I said earlier with breakfast, you have to be a fruit or a vegetable. So if um, one of our students picks up uh, a chicken sandwich and a milk and then they um, a, a, a piece of fruit. Uh, they have to have a piece of fruit or a vegetable on their plate. Uh, if they were just to walk away with a milk and the chicken sandwich, that is not Um, so they have to pick up that extra fruit or vegetable. They can take a couple fruits, like two vegetables. It can be mixed in, but they have to take at least one cup or one half a cup. Or a vegetable. And then when they're coming, coming home from school, they're majority of them are hungry because they had breakfast in the morning, then they had their lunch. So if you go to the next slide, um, okay. snack ideas, uh, 
would be like cheeses, fresh fruits or fruit cups, uh, veggie dippers, um, assorted nuts, and obviously depending on allergies. So like if, um, if you provided them with some veggie dippers and you could provide them with a hummus instead of like maybe a, a ranch dip or a French onion dip, um, it's a little bit more healthier for them to dip their vegetables in. So with that being said, I, I, um, uh, I hope this like helps them with their, you know, their healthy eating habits. And if, you know, if, if there anything else we can do here at the school, I'd be Okay, can you guys hear Danielle? Is, no, yeah, she dropped out for me too. Oh. And now she's back. Are you back? Um, yes, I'm sorry. I don't know what's wrong. It's okay. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. You are pretty far back there, but um, I was able to hear the majority of it. So. Okay. Um, is there any? I mean, do I need to re go over anything else? I think I think you dropped out right before like your your conclusion. So I think we heard all of snack ideas, but um, <laughs> yeah. If okay. there was anything else you wanted to kind of wrap up with, um, we did miss well, that. Well, I just said if there was any other assistance I can provide with anybody that would you know they feel free to contact me, and I appreciate those of you that are listening. So, thank. Okay. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Um, thank you. Which brings us to um, Nurse Lori. Hello to everybody. And I just want to thank any of the parents out there for sharing your children with us. Um, the things that I want to talk about today, um, like Ethan said earlier, are sleep, um, self-care related to stress, sharing your knowledge with your kids, and staying informed. So sleep is an essential part of everybody's routine and it is indispensable to your health. Just kind of similar to the way exercise helps your body um, with so many benefits, sleep does as well. Um, it helps to lower your stress level. It improves your mood. Better sleep equals better mood. Um, it helps to maintain a healthy body weight. Um, it helps you exercise better. It helps you have more energy in order to increase your exercise performance. Um, and it also helps your um, retention. It helps you in school, improves your memory, um, strengthens your heart. So there's so many benefits to sleep. And it is something that I think as Americans, we can all struggle with. So when we think about how much sleep that we need, what the CDC says, um, the next slide, is that for school-aged children, the ones that we have here, nine to 12 hours of sleep. And when you start to think about how early they have to get up, it can feel a little bit overwhelming because you know the kids here are getting to school at seven o'clock in the morning. Um, and I doubt very many of us are putting our kids down at seven o'clock at night. But it does mean that we need to think about their sleep when we um, are planning our days and planning our activities, especially through the week when they're um, having to get up so early in the morning. So there's a couple of tips um, to increase sleep. One is to put the screens away before bed. And um, Ms. Halleck talked about that. And, I, and I, I loved what she said, an hour before bedtime, because their brains need time to slow down. They can't go from playing Dr. Mario to going to sleep. Their brains are just too revved up. Um, trying not to overschedule your kids. If you're not even getting them home until nine o'clock at night and then they've got to do their homework and they've got to eat and all these things, there's no way they can get enough sleep. So just think about that when you're making your decisions about your schedule and just consider, you know, when are we gonna get home with our um, different activities? 
creating a bedtime routine helps. I'm sure when you're when they were younger, that was probably more of a thing that they did. But even so, kind of knowing what they can expect helps to know when they um, it helps their body know it's time to go to sleep. And then just like with with the screen time, be firm with them. You know, my eighth and ninth graders still have a bedtime and they don't like it particularly, but they know it and they expect it. And it, and it just it helps their bodies know when it's time to go to sleep. Um, so I just, you know, I, I just think it's a really good idea to understand how much sleep actually does help us so that we can make that a priority um, for our children. Then I want to talk about a little bit about stress in children. This this year, the past year and a half, has been a very stressful time for kids, especially for everybody, for adults, for children, but I'm sure that everybody's kids have experienced stress in this past year. You know, one myth is that young kids don't experience stress, and that's not true. They have emotions, they have feelings, just like we do, and they do experience stress. Another myth is that mental health problems or stress in children is a result of bad parenting. And that's not true either. Um, there are so many causes for kids to feel stress and us feeling guilty doesn't do a whole lot of good to resolve that. Um, we see signs of stress in children as both physical and behavioral changes. Children respond differently to stress based on age, their personalities and coping skills. And sometimes as parents that can make it hard. And those of us with multiple children probably see that, that our different children respond to different ways. And one may seem to be more affected by stress in a physical way, or another might take everything in. So we just need to be watching our children as individuals for um, signs of stress. Mm -hmm. um, different physical changes can include bedwetting, stomach aches, headaches, decreased or increased appetite, and sleep problems. And I see a lot in the clinic, I see a lot of stomach aches and headaches, especially this time around testing. And I know a lot of that has to do with kind of the anxiety and the pressure that is put upon them um, or that they put upon themselves. Um, so a lot of times stress comes out as stomach aches and headaches. Okay, Ethan. Okay. There's also behavior changes, moodiness, aggression, clinginess, um, nervous habits, fears, getting in trouble, withdrawal from friends and family. So if you start seeing changes in your children, then you just kind of want to look and see, is there something going on at school? Are they having trouble with friends? You know, just start asking them questions. Because I'll tell you, when they come into the clinic with some of the symptoms like stomach aches and headaches, if it's not obvious as to what's going on, I start asking those questions too. You know, what's going on in your classroom today or what's going on at recess? Just to try to kind of understand why they may be having um, the symptoms that they're having. But in terms of creating habits, I want us to kind of talk about the self-care related to stress and good habits. Just like with healthy eating and exercise, we need to create good behaviors. And if we can start practicing self-care at a young age, it can really help them as they get older because the stress and things that our kids are facing only is gonna get more as they get into middle school and high school. So the earlier your child learns some of the things we're gonna talk about, the more likely they are to keep these habits into adulthood. And just like with what Carrie and Danielle were saying, healthy eating, exercise, we have to model these things for our children. We need to do these things with our children so that they see that because they do, especially at this age, they look to us for, um, you know, for different behaviors. Okay, so on the next couple of slides, I've just got some examples of some healthy coping strategies. Okay. I don't know where they went. Okay. okay, so there's, and I have them kind of in different ways. There's creative coping strategies. And and when I say this, look at, you know, you know your children best. You may have a child that doesn't like to draw. So drawing would not be a stress reliever. You know, so just, you know, as you look through these lists, you know, if you have a child that loves to play the piano and that helps them relieve stress, encourage that. 
make up a new game, um, play a game with a family, have them call a friend, read a book together. Um, can you go to the next one? Mm -hmm. um, there's more active things like going for a walk or a run, doing some stretching, jumping jacks. That's a good one. We do that with my older child a lot when he's feeling kind of stressed out. He goes down and just gets that energy out, releases that tension. Um, squeeze on a stress ball, listen to music, tense and relax your muscles. So there's lots of examples. I won't read them all to you, but there's lots of examples here. And like, and like she was saying earlier, you can Google almost anything nowadays. So if, if none of these things seem appealing, just get online and look for strategies. But these, these aren't all, it's not always obvious to your child that they need to do some things to relieve stress. So you may want to help them, um, learn these strategies. And these, this word strategy is something they hear at school through the counseling department, through my clinic. You know, we talk about, let's, let's think about a strategy to help you to deal with this situation. Um, okay. The next thing I want to talk about is the fact that your child is growing up and we cannot stop it. Um, so we've got to talk to them about the changes that are going on in their bodies and about what's happening to them. Okay. Yeah. Um, children have questions about health related topics and a lot of the decisions that they make now can affect them for the rest of their life. They're going to hear things from their teachers. They are hearing things from their devices. They are hearing things from media, from their, from their peers. So what I want to challenge all of us to do is you as the parent needs to also be a source of information because especially on topics that are related to your values. Um, they want to hear it from you. You would much rather them hear about some of these topics from you than from their friends, because then you know they're getting good information. And I just want to tell you they're getting information. <laughs> so um, it, it's out there. Um, okay, next slide. So uh, talking to your kids. You know, one thing that... Um, as they're, they're getting bigger. I just tried to put up things that I thought about, you know, why do I need to shower? Why do my armpits stink? You know, fourth grade, if they're not already wearing deodorant, it's probably time. Um, but they may not think of that. Um, a lot of you know, puberty, it's happening. Um, you may not think that it's time to talk to a, a daughter about the fact that she will be getting her period, but guess what? They're getting them here in this school all the time. So hygiene, personal safety, um, talk to them about why they're so moody. Maybe if they can understand that, it'll help them. They need to know about boundaries. They, they may wanna know about the acne on their face. You know, bullying, give them some tips on how you would want them to handle a bully. All of these things are just so important because like I said, their friends are talking to them about these things. And so you want them to get information from you. Um, they will get some formal education here at school as well um, on, on a lot of this stuff, but it, there's nobody that knows your, your child better than you. Um, so I just really encourage you to talk to your child. Okay, next slide. And then the, other, the last thing is to be proactive with, with their healthcare, please. Take them to their well kid visits. It's at these visits that their growth is tracked. Their, you know, the doctor's going to ask you about their sleep, their behavior, their development. It's an opportunity for them to get the vaccines that they need and the screenings that are appropriate for their age. So the, those visits are very important to keep up with. Um, we also, here at school in third and starting next year in fifth grade, they will get screening for, you know, their eyes and their ears and their teeth. So they will get that here. Um, but there's nothing as good as their pediatrician and, and having a, um, you know, they have just have the right equipment and the right information. Okay, next. Okay. And then just, you know your child more than anybody else. So trust your instincts, stay informed. And if you don't know something, reach out and ask for help because there is no shame in that whatsoever. And 
we as a you know a staff here at school want to help you and your children so please if there's some way that we can help you if you have a if you have questions about your child's health or a medicine that your child needs to be put on or different things like that please call me and if i don't know the answer i can get you to where you need to be and i think we all feel that way if we don't know we will help you find the answers that you need so all right all right thank you um, just to wrap up the presentation, um, here are four um, really good websites that are um, really good with pretty much any question that you might have, honestly. Like, as I was going through these, and um, I, got, I got these links from, um, I think, mostly um, Nurse Lori, um, but they're all really, really good websites, and they have, like, pretty much every question um, that you could think of if you want to consult anybody on this presentation, definitely do that. I'm going to th I'm going to throw up a, a contact page soon. Um, but these websites are also going to be a really good um, way to get maybe a different voice as well. Um, the first one we want to talk about is Strong for Life, um, which is run through the Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, the Children's Hospital. Um, they've got expert advice and opinions, and they have advice for children of all ages. So I think their articles are kind of broken up into age group, right? So that might help um, you maybe uh, focus on your specific student and get information that's more related to them on an age-by-age -age basis. And they've also got a, a newsletter sign-up, which I believe is probably a monthly email newsletter where you've got um, all the all the different articles and some um, highlighted advice that's coming out every single month. So because there's always stuff that we can be learning. Um, next up, I want to highlight the CDC's um, page right here, Healthy Living, which has so many popular topics, like dozens and dozens of popular topics, um, ranging from you know, puberty, like we were talking about, to sleep, to stress, to like drug use and um, other things that, you know, you're going to have to eventually talk to your children about, but maybe having some kind of guidance on this um, wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, this one also is split up into different life stages as well as specific populations, right? So if we're looking at different, um, how, um, you know, maybe different uh, communities are affected by different, um, you know, health concerns that might be good to look at as well, as well as emergency preparedness, right? So um, not just make sure you have a first aid kit, but also, you know, how to use it and um, at what point, um, you know, you should you should seek out different term, different um, ways to deal with maybe health concerns um, in an emergency. And the last one, the second to last one we're going to talk about is the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, which is run out of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, they've got some really good kind of like at a glance tip sheets on uh, weight management, nutrition and healthy eating, physical activity, and reducing screen time, which we've already talked about several times in this um, presentation. Um, but there's um, some really good stuff on there. And those are, those are almost... Um, um, very, very easy to look at because it's, it's a lot of information very quickly, but they, the way that they present it is very straightforward. So you're not, you know, searching around to find what you need. Like they're really kind of at a glance sort of like infographic. And then the last one we're going to talk about is this website, kidshealth.org. It is a nonprofit that's run by a group of physicians, like several, several physicians. And the site is separated by audience, right? So they have um, resources and articles and information geared towards parents, geared towards kids, geared towards teens, and finally geared toward educators. Um, so pretty much any um, category you could fit yourself in, I think um, that website would be really good to reach out to, um, maybe learn something and um, figure out how to apply it in your own home or if you're an educator um, in the school. Um, so like I said, here is our contact sheet. If you have any further questions that we didn't get to in this presentation and you've, you're not here for the Q&A that we're about to do, um, definitely reach out to us, um, you know, call, email, let us know what you want, um, and we will be happy to um, answer our question, answer your question, or connect you with somebody who can. And with that, we are going to wrap up the Healthy Habits Parent University session. Thank you guys for watching this to all the parents in the future that are going to be watching this recorded. Thank you so much. Again, if you have questions, definitely reach out and contact us. Um, thank you again to our presenters for taking the time and lending your expertise to this presentation. Hi. I knew it was going to be good, and y'all did not disappoint. So thank you so much.